Are you ready if you needed to defend yourself? The starting point of resilience is you want to be there. Dr. Itai, how are you? I'm good. Thanks for having me on, Chris. Hey, it's an honor. Absolutely. My pleasure. How, how is Jerusalem? Well, it depends on what period you're asking. You know, uh, <laughs> if you look back uh, a couple of weeks ago, we had here a small conflict going on here in Israel. There was rockets from Gaza. And a lot of domestic terrorism that took place. Um, I just landed from the United States. I believe it was the 18th of uh, May. And I got called in urgently uh, by the military uh, for about uh, 20 days to be involved in some of the activities. So... Um, for now, for now, it's relaxed until the next time. Yes. We'll come on and talk about that because such a beautiful <laughs> part, beautiful part of the world. I love, I love the desert and one wonderful people I've met traveling through the deserts of the world. Um, but before we do that, we've got to say a big thank you. I got to bear with me here. Georgi Hussar. There we go. Yes. That's my, that's my best Romanian accent, friends at home, if you're wondering. Georgi came on the podcast the other day. What a wonderful gentleman. He is a Krav Maga master. And at the end of the podcast with Georgi, he said, Chris, I have somebody that you should really meet. <laughs> And he's put me in touch with Dr. Gill. And uh, it, Itay or Itai? Itai. Itai, sorry. You, we, I did ask you this the other day. I just, my small brain, well, small body as well. But <laughs> so, um, Yes, another Krav Maga master, but even like more of a master, Israeli Special Forces Commander, Doctor, and of course you now, um, well, not now, but you're also successful in business, and again, we'll, we'll come and talk about that. Can we take your military service first? Is that okay? Yeah, we can talk about some of the stuff. I'm not sure I can discuss everything, but yeah, let's yeah. start. Let's not get off. We don't want to get ourselves in trouble with Mossad. They will find you. That's the thing, you know, that uh, they always do. I'm pretty sure they found me already. <laughs> yeah. Have you seen my podcast? Um, yeah. Yeah, so I'm, I'm guessing you... Um, Join the military as military service, was that originally? Correct. Everybody here in Israel uh, has to serve mandatory at age 18. And uh, there's different branches in the IDF. Uh, so, for example, in general, very in general, we have what we call the Air Force. Anything in the sky belongs to the Air Force. Anything in the ocean belongs to the Navy. And anything on the ground belongs to the ground forces. OK, yeah. Now, in the ground forces, you have so many different things. So you can have artillery, the armory, tanks and so on. And then you have like British, American or other neighbor countries around us that they have military. It's like paratroopers and different types of infantry. 
And then there's probably smaller sections of what they call the elite, the tier one. And what we refer here is to the special forces or commandos. And then those are already different sections. So, for example, during wars or conflicts, uh, you know, if I go back into the 80s and then a little bit later on, uh, Lebanon, where I participated in the conflict in Lebanon, June 1982. I was in Lebanon for about two and a half years, I believe. And um, I'm not the only one, so it doesn't make me anything special. So just to you know, make the audience understand the structure. And um, then uh, uh, what we call IBW, in between war, there's preparation. You know, there's the same wish for peace, prepare for battle. So usually, usually um, we have the foreign and domestic sections. Uh, usually, domestically, Israeli soldiers protect the borders at some different levels, okay? Because we're surrounded with those who want to look at the map, they can understand the structure. And then you have what we call the elite, the commandos that um, even during peace times, so-called peace times, there's a lot of stuff going on behind the scenes that not everything I can explain, but there's a lot of prevention taking place or analyzing or collecting intelligence or seizing and capturing uh, high-risk individuals involved in terrorism against Israelis or the neighbor countries as well that are in uh, the coalition. So, for example, uh, the British, the Americans, the Australian, Israel are very well connected in the ties of collecting and sharing certain intelligence information. So that's another scope inside the ground forces. And then, of course, inside you talk about, you know, intelligence, you can talk about cyber, you can talk about satellites, you can talk about, oh, Air Force does intelligence reconnaissance and so on. And so it goes, it's a pretty interesting structure. I'm assuming similar nations, allies have similar structures, plus minus. And um, I think it's, uh, we're small, but very efficient, I would say. There's no, there's no Mickey Mouse and goofing around. If a job needs to get done, it will be done. That's pretty much it. Yes. So you've been a special forces commander. And now from our, our previous conversations, do I understand rightly your part? I've been watching the, is it Fat Fowder? Powder, correct. Powder. Gosh. So basically, uh, it's it's for friends at home. This is a, a a drama, a TV drama that has been made uh, about the undercover special forces teams that literally go what what we would call four, fourteen in or the British. We have we all we, we have, call them we call them we call them the great teams. Yeah, you guys call them great teams. Americans will sell ghosts. We call them great. Um, so yeah, I was involved uh, in the reserves as um, in in one of those sections where I was for probably twenty years. They're a part of commandos, commando regiment like your SAS, but they're a small section inside the commandos that speak languages in different dialects. Mm. And um, yeah, they're one unique bunch of people. You'll walk into the guy, bump into the guy in the street, you'll never know, you'll never say. Um, really special breed of men. And uh, I had the honor to be involved in some serious training for these type of guys for many, many years. So what I call combat at zero, God forbid, they will be exposed and, you know, possibly taken by force. Uh, we cannot allow that to happen. So they have to be very skilled in language, body language, hand-to-hand -hand combat, weapons, improvising, escape and evade, and the whole whole package and it's um it's not an easy job very high stress and language school is a long journey as well so um yeah 
that's just one of the things and uh, that I was involved in. Uh, I will mention that uh, for those who saw and we discussed uh, the BBC channel Hell Week that I was involved in in 2015, where we do selection. Uh, so I was also elite counter-terror warfare team. That is the number one team in the country that takes care of all the problems that no one wants to talk about. Uh, mm -hmm. Also a very elite group of uh, guys. Very physically and mentally demanding job, not for everybody. You know, when people say God created all men equal, I disagree. If they were all equal, they will all be SAS and SBS and Israeli Special Forces. So, <laughs> you know, um, talking later on about uh, will, desire, winner mentality, resilience, and so on. We'll discuss that later. But uh, uh, that's pretty much what my career was involved around. So I'm still active with the government in the reserves. I get called in frequently. And and trying to contribute as much as I can on training, mentoring the younger generation. And pretty much that's it. That's what I do. Yes. And you do it. Many of your country persons do it because you have national service, which is something we Correct. don't we don't Correct. have over here. And it's let's just say it's tech. Security is taken incredibly seriously in, in your part of the world. Well, we have no other alternative, you know. Uh, I mean, if you think about it historically, Israel has been under attack since the establishment of Israel and even before 1948. We had our ups and downs and rough moments of terrorism. You know, so... Um, <laughs> yes 1948 and um there hasn't been much peace peace since has there correct so uh again we look at the map and see who we are surrounded with and uh, we had our tough challenges and uh, me of course i was born much later so I know stories from family and members and, you know, what you learn in history. And I will say that um, during my service and things that I was already aware of, it's like the Yom Kippur War 1973, that I was already a youngster. And, you know, the Six Day War, I was probably five years old, so it doesn't really, you know, I just know from history, but uh, we had some very very interesting events that later on took place that I think that, first of all, for the most Israelis, and of course me as a youngster, we, uh, I started to understand that um, I think one of the things that I was young enough but still educated enough to understand was um, the Munich terrorist attack at the Olympic Games where um, Israeli athletes were taken hostage and it went real bad and all of them were killed. And it was a catastrophe. And um, I remember at the time, Golda Meir was uh, prime minister of Israel. And, you know, after the Holocaust uh, of millions of Jews being, uh, you know, killed, I would say that Golda Meir understood that if we don't take care of our own business, uh, we're not going to make it. And I think that um, that was probably, in my opinion, uh, was a, a game changer in that point. Um, Israel did offer the Germans back in the day, if I recall correctly, to have some intervention team, Israeli teams come in and take care of it. But um, the Germans said no other, Israeli, no other military force will come on our German soil. So that was a big catastrophe for the state of Israel, also because of the morale and ego 
I would say, that the Germans didn't deal with it properly at the time. Only later on, many years later on, they built their counter-terror team, GSG-9, that, by the way, today is in very good relationship with the Israeli counter-terror team, Yamam, where I served, and there's joint programs. But going back historically, back, some years later on, then you had the Antebbe, where Air France aircraft was hijacked, landed in Uganda. My um, my direct boss, Major General Ali Kron, uh, was a young lieutenant back in the day. And uh, they had probably 72 hours to plan the most daring mission, land in a foreign country with very little preparation. They actually built a mock-up similar to the airport and stormed it hundreds and hundreds of repetition to get the drill done right. And it was considered a one-way ticket. Like, um, if we are not able to save 103 hostages by deploying Israeli commandos, um, it's all or nothing, you know? <laughs> we all know who dares wins, right? So um, I think me being uh, brought up in those type of environments, maybe, had an effect on the way I view life. Uh, mentioning that I was involved in the martial arts from a very young age, so I was accustomed to full contact and lots of judo and martial arts back in the day, since I'm five years old. So um, I thought that was also a God-given thing that I had when I joined the military. I was a very gifted athlete, and that helped me a lot to overcome a lot of physical stress and demands that you need to be in one of these top teams. You know, um, it is very easy to give up, very easy to give up. And uh, being strong, being strong physically is a bonus, but it's not necessarily the main product. So I would say, I would say in very general, us having this discussion about those periods, my childhood up to the military, joining the service at age 18 like everybody else, being able to qualify to go into commandos, later on from commandos transfer and go through other selection and other very rigorous training to the counter warfare team. I would say that's probably environment influence things that come from family from home the way you're brought up because you can come from a broken home and still be successful uh, there was many great examples like that that people came from real bad homes and were brought up roughly but it made them resilient uh, it's the way each individual copes with uh, you know problems and deals with it and if they want to change their life, there's many options. Military would be, in my opinion, one of the best ways to take teenagers in our generation and straighten them out because I think we have become a very soft society and that's something we can talk later on. But I would say overall, Israel is a very resilient nation. So my daughter served in the military. My son, my son Tom, was Special Forces sniper. And like... Where does this come from? Probably from family and probably understanding the political situation that Israel is in. And um, hopefully, hopefully doing the right thing to protect future generations and having a stable and hopefully a happier life. And pretty much that's it. That's, uh, that's my angle on that specific topic. How have you coped then with, um, I mean, I'm guessing you've seen a lot of bloodshed because there is, there is, there is a lot of bloodshed over there. How, how, do, you, how do you stay, um, how do you keep your mental health up? Well, I will honestly say that as you're going now into things that are actually my academic specialty is performance under pressure and resilience. That's I talk about this a lot in the service when I train recruits, younger and older ones that are already in the service. Mm -hmm. The word performance under stress is, is really interesting because, so for example, 
job description, what do you want a military member to be able to, to do? So, for example, complete different scope. Let's talk about a paramedic. A paramedic is supposed to be able to reach an injured individual car accident or whatever, knife attack, gunshots, and, and analyze as fast as possible the source of the injury and apply a life-saving technique or skill, block bleeding if it's uh, you know a lot more serious guts are all over, maybe someone's burned from a fire, the smell, brain fluids all over, lots of blood. Will that individual that went through the training to qualify as a paramedic in an ambulance, and you guys have plenty of those in the UK, or a military medic, or a trauma doctor in the military, or the ER, what type of skills do they need to possess on top of doing the technical ability of applying a tourniquet, okay, on a, on a, on a, on a serious bleed out? What kind of mental ability do they need to possess to actually do that, remain calm, make decisions, not freak out, not panic and like, oh, my God, oh, my God, what do I do? I cannot perform. And even later on, will they have, after many, many cases like this, will they struggle with some type of similarities to the beginning of exposure to PTSD at even at the minor level. I am assuming, I'm assuming firefighters that are breaching cars every day in car collisions, cutting in with the jaws of life and rescuing babies or families, and they will see so many dead people and they're underpaid and not respected enough. And I love these guys. They'll jump into fires to save families at any given time, even though they're underpaid. And they deserve more respect. I think medics, paramedics, ambulance drivers, policemen, that will do a life-saving things. They also know some basic medical skills. What I'm saying is that job description, did that person want to do that job? Did he want to be there? That's the first question. Did he want to do that? Do you want to be a firefighter or jump into a fighter? You do understand the consequences. You can't say you didn't know it's like a lion that wants to hunt. Of course, it needs to be careful from the horns when it's hunting. It can die. It's a calculated risk. Um, but what mental ability does a person need to be able to do that? So um, setting measurements in place, who can and who cannot, is one of the things that I deal with. Does everyone? that wants to apply to SAS or SBS or any other similar forces around the world, Navy SEALs, and Delta Rangers, et cetera, Israeli commandos. Everybody needs to go through some type of screening and filtering, first of all, to see here and here, are they okay? So we have some type of barometer or scale to say, we have someone that is, I would say relatively a solid individual, doesn't crack down easy, strong individual, strong will, above average, that when he's wet, when he's cold, when he's tired, when he's hungry, when he has to march with heavy loads on his backpack for many, many miles in all terrains, it can be in the desert in Israel because we train in the desert. So for people who don't know what it means to march navigate in the desert 20 to 30 miles with a backpack they don't understand nothing about pain and not showering for days and for weeks and then the sand and the dust and the hot temperatures that are another enemy and oh from there going into the water environment water environment you're wet all the time it's cold it's freezing you don't get to choose the temperatures as well if you're in the mountains we have here lots of mountains in the Galilee area and Lebanon and so I operated in mountain areas and when you're uphill and you need to carry heavy loads but someone has to do it so I'm looking for people that say I want to do that I'm willing to do it. I will give it my best shot. Not everybody passes, but 
the starting point of resilience is you want to be there. You're willing to take a calculated risk or understand, oh, I can be seriously disabled in combat. And by the way, there's accidents in training. We all know this, you know. And there's shin splints. You can break bones in your feet. You can have lower back problems that most airborne people have. <laughs> if you jumped, you'll know. And knee problems, orthopedic problems of any kind, and medical issues that later on when you're older start to pop up. Eh. Are we crazy people? I don't know, but somebody's got to do it. So, you know, I was still born in a generation where I thought, well, first of all, it's mandatory, but yeah, I do not see myself being behind the desk pushing pencils. So uh, just like you, you were a Royal Marine. And, you know, what I mean, what makes someone want to do that, you know, and navigating the mountains with heavy loads when it's really freezing temperatures, you know, plus three Celsius or rain, you don't get to choose the day. You still got to do it. And those are the things that we're looking in the human puzzle. People that can cope and adapt to different environments with a snap of the fingers. Oh, desert, bam, no problem. Water, we're on a boat, no problem. You're in the mountains, no problem. Making shelter, no problem. Not eating kitchen food for long terms, being away from home for long terms. <sighs> that brotherhood, that unity, being among men, the guy on the left, the guy on the right. He will do whatever it takes to protect you as a team member. That is something that most people that have not served lack of understanding, the trust, the loyalty. And by the way, when, if, if you did see the BBC show, um, I ran a very interesting drill that uh, where you have to do all these assignments, dragging a tire, burpees, push-ups, running, climbing, jumping, whatever task it is, physical task. But what the participants do not know, there is a hidden camera recording them. And um, after the assignment is completed, we ask the individuals, have you completed all assignments to full completion? And all of them swear on their mother's grave that oh yes, I did all the pull-ups, I did all the burpees, I did all the push-ups, and when you look at the video, a certain percentage of the population that did not know they're being recorded, and you discover they cheat. Now, when you do that kind of measurement and you expose them to the truth, oh, you cheated. So, is that an indication that? Oh, with a blink of a finger or a blink of an eye, like, oh, I, I can cheat on my teammates if things go wrong. I'll save my skin first. So I, I cannot train trust and loyalty. And I think that is one of the main measurements. And that goes later on into the business world, business life. How do people become really successful in business? When your word is a solid word, you say, I will do, and you do, and you do perform. Here you go, a military application that can be come into the business world and make, by the way, relationships, children, finance, money, health. So many things we can, uh, you know, it can go anywhere. It's like an octopus. Yes, it's interesting. The world is changing. Um, and you see this reflected in the way people are you can make an awful lot of money now just it seems like being really rubbish at what you do dark garbage um I, I, yes people can be so i think we, i think youth and society is being brainwashed by things that actually damage your iq and um, the ability to make a decision 
is lacking. Education in school is not as it used to be. And by the way, I shared with you a video, and if you want to share it later on with the audience, La Sierra High School from the 1960s, where if you look where we are 50 plus years ago and where we are now with youth, youth in high schools, where JFK, the president of the United States that was assassinated, he believed in having a strong and mental resilient society based on performance. If you push students to be athletic and they're happy in their body, they feel good, they eat clean food, and we can talk about the relation between nutrition and being happy and healthy and performing, um, you will be able to have a very strong society. So if we go back into the 60s, possibly his plan was that during the Cold War with Russia, if he needed to have a million young guys called in to join the Marines to go to war with the Russians, I am assuming with the, with the, the level of fitness that you witnessed in the video, <laughs> it would be much easier for them versus young people today that are completely overweight. Many of the boys have nipples like women. It's something to do with the food and hormones, but definitely something to do with family because I have kids and all my kids are very athletic. We eat very clean food and their performance is very high. I think their self-esteem is high. They're not bullied because they look really good and very athletic. So no, so there's no reason. You see what I'm saying? So the starting point is much better. Now, where does that come from? It comes from home, education, parenting. So we can take on a different spectrum, another family that, you know, the father beats up the mother. They do a lot of alcohol or some type of drugs and the kids eat shit, junk, fast food. I think that's probably one of the purposes of society to, to make people poisoned and stupid. Believe it or not, it's just a personal opinion. And my conspiracy theorist, I, you know, I, I analyze information as it is. If I'm looking 56 years ago where we were and where are we now, instead of evolving, we're going down. There's a lot more hate instead of love. I don't know. So um, that's something that we need to look into very closely with our brain and with our heart. Yes. Life is a massive conspiracy. It, um, it, until you work it out, you don't see it. But when you work it out, then you then it's it's omnipresent. It's is everywhere. Correct. And yeah. uh, so we're 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 in very challenging times right now in deep waters. And yeah, I'll stay away from politics, but I have my opinions about what's going on. Well, let's. Let's not talk about uh, medical stuff, if you know what I'm saying, but you have only got to look out the window to see how easily led um, the majority of people are. And it's, it's because they've never been allowed to evolve their thinking. You're saying the exact word, critical thinking. It's... People were not educated and indoctrinated to think and solve problems. Have an opinion. Listen to both sides and make a choice. Even if you make a choice that I disagree with, it doesn't mean that I'm right and you're wrong. It's a choice. It's like you like a certain food and I like a certain food and so on and so on. So, but again, at least look at the data, analyze it with an open mind and an open heart. And that's what I'm saying. And do the right thing for you. That's yeah, it. And the, 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 other, the other one that's a very good yardstick or meter stick for life is like follow the money. Follow the money. Who, who, who stands to gain from making you do certain behaviors? 
Who's making the money off it? It's it's not rocket science to well, work. Let me, ask you, let me ask you a real simple question. And if the audience is going to see this, why is organic food 10 times more expensive than regular food on the shelf? So if you want to go and get a fast food burgers of any brand, okay, versus getting fresh grinded meat, grass fed, non-GMO, no hormones, no steroids, no whatever chemicals in it, it would cost you a fortune. And even then when they would sell it to you, you wouldn't even know if it's, you know, if you want free range organic eggs from a, from chicken. Would, I'm saying it, it is there, but it's there for the people that can afford it. Now, if we didn't give any chemicals to all the plants and vegetables and didn't spray them with whatever, you know, toxins to keep away the pesticides, right? I mean, there are technologies to, to, to grow veggies and that it would be very difficult for, for, you know, I mean, there's hydroponic, right? Everybody, I mean, that follows a little bit knows. And um, it doesn't really need any chemicals to be sprayed on it. I'm assuming, I'm assuming that if it was done by large scale through the industry, we can help a lot of people with medical problems to feel healthier and better, perform better, to be more clear in their brain, do more sports. And I just think when you say follow the money, we both know that the money is directed to keep most people weak, sick, depending on something that was not a God given. And that bothers me. That bothers me a lot. And by the way, that's in our house. So, for example, in our household here, we do not have any sweet drinks of any kind. There's no Coca-Cola. There's no, there is no junk food of any kind. We eat very, very clean uh, as much as possible. We try to get organic. There's complete days where me and my wife and the children were uh, vegetarian and then two, three times a week, different types of protein from animal, fish, red meat, chicken. And then there's a lot of fasting as well, just cleaning the body. Shut your mouth. Most people need to snack and nibble on nonstop because the taste buds and the demand of sugar to the brain spikes the insulin and so on and so on. So again, now we're glitching into nutrition, health benefits to raise performance. That's another thing, by the way, that I discuss a lot um, with high-performance people. Do you want to perform better? Change your lifestyle. How many people want to perform better? Are they willing to change the lifestyle? It's so easy to tell people what to do, but if you're a role model, and um, that's why I wake up every morning very early and do my fitness routine in the gym in the house. I have a small gym. Every day I wake up, so when my kids see me, they say, he's a role model. I don't brag about it, but I just... They see me every day doing pull-ups. Every day I'm doing squats. Every day I do push-ups. Every day I do explosive sprinting and some type of physical activity and martial arts and hand-to-hand combat. I'm a very physical guy for my age. In a regular good day, I can do 10 sets of 10 of pull-ups. Most young people will not be able to do that. So I'm not saying I'm a world-class level athlete by any means. I'm just saying for a regular white guy, I try to keep here and here strong. That's it. Yes. If my son, if he gets up and he doesn't make the bed, he he, gets, he gets told to go back and do it. <laughs> well, I think also the generation today of the young children is, um, they believe they're entitled. So, so dealing, de- dealing with some of the things that I discussed, discussed in my research and academic papers is that um, 
negative, negative, negative results are very, very good for us. So failure is an amazing ally, an amazing empowering tool. You must fail in order to, to succeed later on. There is no all the time success. You know, you were interviewing George Huzar and he trained with me and he's one of my top instructors. And I will say that we go full on hand to hand combat against a rubber knife. Well, you think, you think when George stabs me or I stab him, when we do drills full on, I manage to block and defend all the time successfully? No. Gun disarm, same. Full on attack with some type of simulated pipe or baton, full on. Two against one. You know, multiple attackers. They try to beat you down to the ground or drag you into a van or something. Home invasion, rape. We don't always get it right. We need to fail so many times in order to possibly raise the bar to reach some type of success. Isn't it the same way in the military? What, we always get it right? We always hit all targets when we're shooting with a rifle or a gun? The answer is no. But bouncing back and coping with frustration to turn failure into success, that is the most resilient sense of skills a person needs to train himself. It's, you can help someone in coaching, but it's self-training. You need to say, I want to do this. I need to do this to save my soul. I want to be happier. It's nothing to do with money, by the way. It has nothing to do with money. I mean, you can have all the money in the world, but if you're not healthy, I mean, look at Steve Jobs. He had more than everybody else, but he still had cancer and died. Mm -hmm. So like I said, you got to train yourself. You got to push yourself to the limit and every day set a higher bar and a better standard for you as a role model if you decide to have a family for your for the children, for all your friends around you that you can instead of dragging people down, push them up, be be a motivational inspiration, even at a very small scale. You know, not everybody is like a legend speaking on YouTube with millions of followers, like but in your own small circles, can you do miracles? Can you save someone's life? Can you help them to be more successful? Can you help them to be healthier and happier? And I mentioned Steve Jobs had a lot of money, but he died from being sick, cancer. We're surrounded with invisible enemies all the time, cancers, diseases, and so on. There's things that are in our control. I mean, it doesn't mean we're... We're immune from everything. You want to know the crazy, the crazy thing? Yeah. People in people in this country, we we we've been lied to so much from from birth that all the medical and stuff and biology has just been hidden from everybody. So people here still think like cancer is something that. Like you might get it, maybe you don't, but you know, it's real bad luck. If it's not uh, bad luck, it's nutrition and vaccines. Yes. But again, I'm not a medical doctor, so anyone listening to me, for them it may be nonsense. I'm not an authority on this, but just from the reading that I do, well and speaking to medical experts, that's the information. And with my brain, I wish to analyze and I I ask myself, how is it possible so many people in the population are having these type of problems? Yeah. So just logic. Connect the dots. Yeah, we don't even have to talk about the that 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 word because even back from there, um, if you eat a nutritious alkaline based diet you don't get it i haven't been ill i always say 17 years but i think it's 18 years now not a single cough or a cold 
there's been times when I've gone back to like the junk food. When I say junk food, I don't mean like McDonald's. I mean what what people eat in this country, which is like a steak and chips and egg and chips or or fish and chips or or, or meat and potatoes. It has to be meat every night, every night, and all this refined carbohydrate or or carbon it's not just that it's the oil that the french fries are fried in yeah that at high temperatures they become chemicals and toxins so of course but no nanograms no. nanograms in the digestion go into the bloodstream and later on you know mm. diseases blood clots whatever heart attacks and everyone wants to blame proteins and fat actually good fats are pretty good i eat lots of plenty of fats every day Avocados and nuts, that's a great source of fat. Mm. Hey, you can do that all week. Yeah. It's just so funny though that I eat avocado every day. Just I, we have avocados here every day in the house. We, I go to the food market and buy big, beautiful avocados. Every day I have one full avocado. Yeah, and this walking around with a bucket of coffee all morning, which has become it's it's a toxic poison and yet it's been sold to us it's like this in heart do you know i don't even have tea or ca- any caffeine now well i have i have i have uh, espresso i i but i don't overdo it i don't abuse it it's i will have some benefits as an antioxidant some claim but um i just love a good coffee but with no milk so milk changes everything the dairy, the way the dairy is p- yeah. produced, not the milk itself from the cow, but the way it's produced. Listen, I wouldn't criticize anyone for having one coffee or one tea a day or e- or even two. Right. I've done that, uh, you know, not so much the coffee because I really think it's bad for you. But but here's the thing. I'm moving away from it now because what I found is when you get off it, whoa, you're you your mood is so much better. And so I don't want to go back to basically poisoning myself. Okay. You know? Interesting. Okay, interesting. Have, have you also noticed if you eat less, you feel better? Listen, I am telling you, I do like this week alone, this week alone and last week, I think I did almost for one week, I did one meal a day with a 24-hour fast in between. So I had between 1 and 2 o'clock one meal, a very big bowl of salad, all the greens and veggies you can imagine, and avocados, nuts inside, four or five boiled eggs, mackerel, mackerels or sardines in olive oil, organic. Mm. and then. Um, that would be one meal, probably 2,000 calories with everything until the next day. And I did that for a week. And um, body mass has not changed. So my BMI has not changed. I feel very strong and energetic. Digestion is very good. And I feel very light because one meal a day. And if you think about, you know, primordial hunters, you know, they didn't always managed to catch every day whatever they wanted as hunters throwing a spear or setting a trap. Or, and uh, we're just used to having, oh, I'm going to go into the groceries, get a bag of potato chips, Doritos, and whatever, open it in front of TV, sitting in the office, snacking on it. Man, they, that, that's, that's how society is structured. They want you to be like that, not like what we're talking about. Yeah. Now... A lot of people say to me, how do you have the willpower to do it? And I said, well, I'm military trained. I'm like, now, what came before, the egg or the chicken? Yeah, what came before? fascinating. Because all what my- came before? So where does, where, does, where does that resilience come from, that will to be, hey, man, I just want to hang out with my kids as long as possible. Is that too much to ask? Mm-hmm. I hopefully, if God gives me, you know, to be... 95 years old, maybe 100, and still my brain functioning without Alzheimer's and dementia, where I can see, you know, 30, 40 years from now, kids, grandkids do amazing things, achieve amazing goals, and just 
just be happy. It's not even about money. Just, I think it's a lot about community, who you hang around with, strong supporting environment, and not just the individual. Yeah. And, you know, if we, we were both military, so the team is everything. Without a team, you can't do nothing. And um, it, it's the same in a business. It's the same in the family. I tell my wife and the kids, we're a team. There's chores in the house, cleaning, vacuuming, throwing the garbage, doing whatever a normal family does. You know, it needs to be done. Everybody's a part of the team. Hmm. That's it. I'll tell you something else, okay? I'm hoping I'm hoping people can learn learn from this conversation. Well, they can learn from it. People write to me a lot and say, wow, you know, thank you so much. I didn't know that, or I didn't know this, or or just to believe in people because p- paradise is for everybody. It's not just for a few, it's for everyone. But the, the trouble is it's so simple to get there, but we've been told it's so complicated because it's all about money and power and material goods. And, and because people focus on that and think it's about job, career, £30,000 a year, a car, two cars, three cars, two houses, one holiday – and it is nothing to do with that very simple stuff you can do from getting out of bed in the morning until 11 o'clock in the morning that little window there's five maybe four things you do that's it bang it's that simple so people will learn from this but another thing because i know you exercise if you don't exercise and get out and move about like a, a hunter gatherer would 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 have moved around for for, mi- for maybe a million years. Um, you can't tell how your body's performing. And, and w- what I mean by that is, when I run in the morning, if I've eaten too much the night before, my stomach is oh, it feels like lead. Like it's 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 doing this where I'm still digesting food from the night before, which is just insane. Um, And that tells me then, don't eat so much the night before, you know, leave a space before you sleep, get it digested, have a nice rest. Maybe maybe you can make your last meal at five o'clock. So there's a 12, 14 hour gap between that last meal till you wake up in the morning and go early in the morning for a jog. So if you did a window of four or five hours, so if you had a very late breakfast, what I would already call, many people would call a lunch, one. So for example, today, my meal, my first meal since yesterday, that was one o'clock, is going to be today about one o'clock, 24 hours. I had one meal yesterday, Mm -hmm. 24 hours. But that's not all the time. I do cycles because the body thinks you're starving it. And um, it won't lose body fat for those who do want to lose body fat. Okay. Me, I'm already pretty low on body, body fat, but I will say this training the body to adapt to different sessions of meals, not having the same routine all the time is important. So for example, having a small window, eat at one, have, if you want chicken, salad, avocado, make, put something with nutrition. Something that counts, quality calories, not calories from donuts that mean that give zero quality fuel to the body. So if you want to treat your body like a Ferrari in the form, weapons, tactics, shooting, being sharp in the brain, making decisions, the nutrition impacts the brain the way we think. The second meal would be in a window of four to five hours max. So if it was one, the last meal's got to be around five or six max, red line. Then you have enough hours to digest all that food. But if you do, you wake up in the morning, coffee with sugar, you had some cookies next to it, you already broke the fast. Two hours later, because you've had something with sugar, you're brain craves for more sugar so it spikes insulin oh i need something else i'll snack on something so a lot of people have three meals a day but they also snack in between so the body never actually goes into starvation ketosis 
Mm. So you're always hungry because you didn't train the body. Can you stay near the near the mic mi microphone, doctor? Because yep. we're I'm yep. losing yep. you again. Thank you. So I'm saying you need to get the body into ketosis so where you're you're now starting to burn fat instead of sugars. And that's how people, if they wish to improve their performance and their body. You see, God gave us this amazing machine that if you treat it well and you put real good fuel into it and give it real good service, it will reward you with great health. The brain, you're just gonna you're just gonna perform so better. And um, when we're hungry, we get upset easily because, and that's when you get upset easily, you get into disputes with the kids, with the wife, you argue, you raise your voice, you're less calculated. People don't know this, but it's related to sugars and carbs, real bad carbs, of course. There's great carbs. So if you have a sweet potato once a week, fabulous. If you have carbs from veggies, great, but they're natural. They're not made in a factory. So if God made it, eat it. If God didn't make it, don't touch it. That's what I tell people. They ask me, oh, what is it? You know, I'm not a nutritionist. I'm just saying what I do. And it makes, it works for me. So I would say that um, I think that those lines, if God made it, eat it. And if he didn't, don't touch it, would be probably the number one line for every average civilian that wants to do something that he can improve himself. If you can pick it from a tree fresh and eat it, go ahead and do it. Mm. Again, don't overdo it. You can't have 20 avocados a day and, you know, two pounds of nuts every day. That way. It's way too much calories for the body. But be behave normal around food too. Don't let food control your happiness. You control the food. That's what people need to understand. Mm. Don't overdo it. Yeah, when I when I ran the length for the United Kingdom. And that's amazing by itself. That's a wow, wow achievement. Amazing. Yeah. Amazing stamina. But do you want to know the worst thing about it? Well, other than breaking my leg, which was that was what I'd say to my son, that was a bit of a challenge, but we we overcame it. The worst thing about it, because I was in paradise, I was just in my element, absolutely loved what I was doing. But the worst thing was trying to find vegetables. Whoa, in this country, you can buy junk food every service station, every, we call it petrol garage, every corner shop, ev everyone... And by junk food, you know, I'm I'm including sandwiches and 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 stuff like this, just refined white bread with meat in the middle. And um <coughs> it was a big thing for me because I know when you go into that world, you 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 come out of you have to come out of paradise to 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 to, to, to be there. And I had to come down off this beautiful, beautiful place to I mean, it was okay. It's okay. You know, sometimes you can live that way for a bit. Well, we did in the military, didn't we? And, and I know you've done it a lot longer than I, than I have. Um, but yeah, but the, the irony and the reason I mention it is I think most people would be surprised to know I'd much rather eat vegetables than anything else. And I can run a thousand miles. And on I do. I do complete cycles on veggies. But you do need protein to sustain muscle mass, so it needs to come from some type of source of eggs or chicken or uh, fish. Yeah. What? Sorry, I should. Red meat, I should. Red meat, I should. Red meat, I, should yeah. well. I should explain, or I probably don't make much sense. When I did, when I started that run, I was actually like ninety nine percent plant based, and I had been for about six months. But in my life, I I just try to have more vegetables on the plate than anything else that's it and then i can have an egg then i can have tuna maybe a bit of chicken just you know, not a lot because it makes me feel so i get like a hangover now if i eat too much like factory meat um, yeah. and uh yeah i think it's it's funny isn't it how food is so much to do with our mood 
and yet you never. Oh talk. yeah, oh there's there's a lot of scientific research to say that um, food controls moods, being positive, being negative. It's the boost of insulin up and down, up and down, up and down, different spikes. So, and we feel cravings, and when we feel the cravings and we don't get it, it's almost like a cocaine addiction to sugars. And the brain needs it, demands it right now. I need my sugars. If not, you get very aggressive. You start shaking, possibly. I can go for days without food. I like I I I've done fasts like two three days easy, just water, not a problem. Just clean the body. It's okay. Train the body how to do it. It will make you feel so amazing. I even get to do the best workouts when I'm hungry. I think, My um, strength is so I, good when I'm hungry because that's probably a, one of the things a God given that when you were needed to go on a hunt, you know, the early man, he needed to go on a hunt. He didn't catch every day. And he needed to be sharp and set an ambush to whatever gazelle or animal out there and throw the spear. And I'm assuming he failed when he threw his spear as well, right? And by the way, talking about performance and talking about hand-to-hand -hand combat that we started with um, earlier, you know, if you look at the ancient Greeks and um, great philosophers, the ancient Greek days, they had pancreation. You ever heard of the word pancreation? The first hand-to-hand -hand combat, wow. officially, that was like, I think, 658 BC in the first Olympic Games, what we call submission wrestling today. Back in the day, that was the main event in those old Olympics. They were elite, elite athlete, boxers, strikers. There's, if you go and do research later on, pancreation, ancient Greek, you'll see old pottery from 3,000 years ago, 2,500 years ago, of things you see in MMA today. Leg locks and chokes and escapes and throws and punches. And, and you say they nourished from a very young age at that day because they needed young kids to grow up to be warriors, you know, Spartans, you know. <laughs> People know it from the movies, but... Uh, uh, Many, many people in, in, in ancient Greece um, believed back in the day, and the philosophers believed that you can only win war if you're, you're educated and trained hard. And if you're not, you're going to lose. And that was, nothing changed. Here we are today, you know. You're not trained, and you cannot fight. You cannot protect yourselves. So a lot of people can't protect themselves today because they lack skill. Uh, they, if they depend on the police to come and save them when something happens, it's already too late, probably. And that's another tool to empower yourself, hand-to-hand -hand combat, some source of self-defense. Uh, the Israeli Krav Maga, of course, from Israel, you know, that we do. Let's, and, uh, let's talk about that then. But bef before we, before we um, do it, I can we... Uh, people are going to hate me if I don't ask you about some special forces or some greys uh, incidents or or some action i mean so for friends at home I, i've been watching this series that the doctor recommended it's Fowder. yeah Fowder, which if i understand right kind of likes me to fuck up <laughs> or like it's all gone wrong and yeah it's it's about these gray teams, so these aren't these these intelligence teams. Undercover, undercover, yeah, commandos, yeah. yeah. Undercover commandos. But it's equally as important about the guys that come in to rescue them if they get compromised. Of and course. There's lots of shooting, there's lots of danger. Um we're talking some serious, you know, people are involved in this this world. It's a multi-billion dollar industry with Air Force has drones in the sky that monitor operations, guys on the ground that are dressed as locals in vans and trucks, and they're the second circle. So, God forbid, one of the team members was exposed or someone pulled on him a gun or uh, tried to interrogate him or they're going to be killed or captured, mm -hmm. what we cannot allow at any cost. And then, if you don't, um, if if you, 
uh, how can we say, if you don't look Arabic, you 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 wear a burqa. So for example, for example, take a guy like me. I'm white skin, right? So I would be dressed as a Muslim woman with full burqa, so you can't see my face. Yeah. And I would be with some type of object on my body that makes me appear to look pregnant. And underneath that casing that's under the fabric, I would have my weapons or whatever. And um, so I would be on the ground with some of the teams back in our days. And um, if things go wrong, you're supposed to intervene. So you're, you're there on the ground. There's no, it's not a helicopter is coming an extraction point five miles in the mountains. Or, it doesn't work like that. You have to have people on the ground. It's like, it's 10 seconds for contact. 15 seconds. And things can go back. So um, it's pretty much that's it. So there's a lot of money and resources involved in getting the job done safely, quietly, no noise, no, a lot of deception. And um, instead of getting into a fight, why not make the guy want to be involved in something he doesn't know? So there's a lot of science behind what the guys do. So it's, it's, it's an exciting thing. I would say the movie, what you're seeing, the television show, Fauda in this case, is a glimpse into the life of what these guys do. Mm. Of course, it's a movie. It's not everything is exactly accurate on purpose because of censorship, but it gives a good idea. Yeah. And the guys, um, obviously, a lot of the time, they, they don't have the opportunity to carry a weapon because they... They're trying to pretend to say be a waiter in a restaurant or or this. They can't. They can't physically. They go inside. They can go inside the mosque and go on their knees and do all the prayers just like a local. So, so it's part of it. But for you guys or the guys that come in to get them out, or or, or, or I guess sometimes they do carry weapons if they're on a different mission. What do, do you get a choice? What pistol you you carry, or is it regulation? Well, the military has its own standards, so there's quite a few things. I don't want to really go into that, but um, some of them will have silencers and stuff like that. So a lot of stuff needs to be done very quietly. Mm. But uh, and it's concealed in certain places very smartly, so I don't want to expose that too. Yeah, okay. Um, because in, in the culture, there's a lot of hugging and embracing. So when they hug you, they actually tap you down to see if you're carrying anything and they will not find it. So. What about, it's all about ha, have have you lost many operatives? Have many been there's there's there's, there's been losses. There's been losses. I would say that um, the teams that I work with, yeah, there's been losses. Not too many, um, but there has been losses. Yeah, yeah, and it usually it's very low key. It's not something that's huge publicity because it's not you need to understand it's not regular warfare what does it mean it's not infantry against another infantry and there's artillery and tanks and there's shrapnel and it's just this is all very surgical it's a real small circle and a very direct action against a certain you know radical person involved in terrorism okay so um, uh, that's pretty much how it's done. It's uh, it's not, there's no noise. It's really, really quiet. It may take the planet months or maybe a year to get a job done. Tracking, monitoring, following. So technology is involved. Feed and signal intelligence where the interest of phone calls. And so it gets pretty, it's, it's pretty high tech with low tech. You actually need, so if you found the guy, still someone needs to deal with it. So tracing, tracking is one skill. Dealing with it is another skill. Mm. So actually, at the end of the day, you need someone to put their hands on the bad guy. What about my mind's kind of going uh, all over the place here because I've, I've been in I've been in Israel and, and Palestine twice now. I've been in Jerusalem twice. Um, what I would say, it, it's quite 
quite easy to get smoke in your part of the world. Cigarettes are, I think, pretty much anywhere in the world you, you know where to go. Yeah, cigarettes yeah. are in grocery stores. Or... Is, is that le- legal in the military, though? Or, or do you tell people not to smoke weed? Any kind of drugs in uh, the military is is not permitted. Oh, okay. so weed, weed of any kind is not permitted. Yeah, no. Is is but weed? So, so I do know there's people that probably do it. Now I'm separating it, not to offend anyone. There is um, what is it called? Cannabis. Cannabis, yeah. Cannabis, cannabis. To, for you know for medical purposes. So that's not you know it's different. But for those who want to smoke, I mean, uh, does it affect anyone personally? Does it harm anyone? Is it considered a real drug? You know, there's a lot of arguments about it to make it legal and so on. So I'm not involved in it. I don't even smoke regular cigarettes. I just don't tolerate the smell of any kind. So I just, if someone wants to do that, it's his business, not mine. Yeah. Is 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 the smoking legal in Israel? I, I'm, I'm I'm gonna guess it's not, but but I'm not. I'm, I, I think it's not. They're trying to legalize it in the parliament. If you have a certain amount in your house for personal use, yeah, it's okay. gonna be legal. Yeah. Versus you're having bags, and you know it's for marketing purposes and dealing. So that would make it complicated. Um, yeah, that's the only thing, the issue I think that comes with. Any other drugs, I think, are completely legal. Mm. And let's talk about the Krav Maga then. So, okay. From my my chat with George, <coughs> he was he was trying to explain it to me. And he said, whereas with some martial arts or some forms of fighting, you might have a different technique for each each different attack. He said Krav Maga is more like it streamlines it down, so you have maybe like five techniques um so there's one technique m- might cover five different five That's correct five different uh, um, he, he did explain it he did explain it correct so the idea is that the way i view krav maga is first of all it's a form of self-defense hand-to-hand combat it's it's, it's the known or the accepted style here among what we call military and law enforcement and even private schools and private people do Krav. They know it's not MMA. It's not, I go for a single leg, double leg, judo, lift, throw, take down. Although there are great sports and there are additional applications for the Krav, it will help you. But in reality, and this is one of the things that I do lectures about performance, and I call it combat at zero. You see, the first line of defense would be, first of all, observation. Did you see there's a problem? So let's say you and I have a verbal confrontation. And I walked up to you and said the F word in your face. And I was with my hands in your face very aggressively. You would have a red light, say, hey, this guy has a problem with me. I need to get ready. But then during this verbal confrontation, no physical yet, suddenly I reached with my hand into my pocket of my jeans. And you didn't pay attention to that. Now, I'm telling you, you're not going to get money. I'm assuming if he put his hand in his pocket, he may be, maybe I'm wrong, but maybe he's pulling out an object, a screwdriver, a sharp blade, some type of brass knuckles, and he's going to whack you. He's going to get you. Time reaction will drop to near zero because you're so close proximity to the event. So if you didn't read the first line of defense, observation, body language, intention. You already failed yourself. Because no, I don't know any style of martial art that can teach you to defend a thing you don't see. So if someone attacks me from behind with a metal pipe and smashes me on the skull, I'll get smashed. It is what it is. If someone stabs me from behind, I'll get stabbed if I didn't see it. Now, if someone shouted from behind, hey, you, There was an indication based on or visual or sound or touch. Three major senses you must apply in self-defense. So if I didn't see the problem, oh, wow, that's bad. Um, If I didn't hear the problem, wow, bigger problem. 
if it touched me and it was a blade, it's already too late. Make sense what I'm trying to say when I'm breaking it down? So the crowd is supposed to be real stupid and simple. A small group of sets of skills that solve many different types of attacks from many different angles. Does it mean we're always successful? The answer is no. But the idea is under stress. And that's my research. I have several videos on YouTube where people claim to be masters and experts. They fail when we pressure test them full on, full on attack, rubber knife, or gun designs and different attacks. And they just, oh, I didn't know it's going to be this aggressive. They were not coached and trained under real extreme environments where me, I bring. So I have videos on YouTube that are more than 20 years old where I built like a kill house, CQB. So there's a maze with rooms left and right, and there's corridors. There's one person in one room, two people in another room. When you go through the maze, you you know it's a drill, but you, it's a, there's an unknown part where you do not know who's going to attack you and from where. And suddenly in a confined space, someone jumps on you and attacks you. And um, wow, you're overwhelmed. Boom, boom, boom. Suddenly you're attacked. Three, four steps. Oh, I didn't know. I didn't see. The reason is this builds up character and, and resilience. We want students to understand failure is part of the process. There is no 100% success. In the movies, yes. In real life, no. So when you look at a movie of some type of very gifted actor that knows how to do amazing movements of martial arts, and he dodges knives and guns and blades and bullets, of course, that's fiction. I was involved a little bit in movies. And of course, it's all choreographed. Five attackers attacking me in a movie is choreographed. In real life, can you really defend yourself from five attackers? It would be a serious challenge. And the price may be very heavy if they have edged weapons. They will probably get you. You will get seriously cut or stabbed or even die. Can you minimize damage? That's the goal. So honest on the table with no flash, no being, uh, you know, with a big ego, it is what it is. If we like it, we don't. Now, one thing that being in the military trains someone's mindset that the average athlete will never possess. I had someone ask me a long time ago, what is more difficult, being an, an MMA fighter or being in the special forces? And I said, well, when the top athlete goes into the ring and his match is about, I don't know, five rounds of three minutes or five minutes, so total, let's say, 30 minutes of whatever endurance he needs to have to do that job description. Block, punch, throw, kick, grapple. Wow. I said, the military member will never have the liberty to tap out when things go bad. So if you're a gifted athlete, and we see many of them in UFC or different organizations, they always have the liberty to tap out. I think if someone is in the Royal Marines or SAS or SBS or a power trooper, if he was deployed and he went into conflict in combat, you can't tell the bad guy, hey, give me a minute. I need to breathe. I need to change my magazine. I have a jam. I have a malfunction. Give me a second. I need to run to that cover and so and so. Now suddenly, grenades, shrapnel, explosives, one of your friends is an amputee. Hey, give me a second. I need to take care of it. You need to drag that individual injured guy inside a, you know, some type of compound or house, barricade him, put a tourniquet. Still, your friends are taking shots from the outside and so on and so on. What I'm saying is, I think military, the way I view it, not everybody needs to agree with me, is such a great contributor to the powerful mindset if you know how to apply it for civilian life. It sets the barometer and the scale straight. I even published an article about it. Is your barometer of happiness, you know, calibrated? What do I mean by this? We have a measurement that's called Richter scale for an earthquake. We have a measurement scale to measure hurricane or tornado. It's called Fujita. But we don't have a measurement to measure stress. So when people say to me, honestly, they come to me 
And they say to me, oh, man, I had a real bad day. I didn't get any smileys and likes on my phone. Wi-Fi was out all day. I couldn't get any messages. I was really depressed. Like, excuse me? Fuck you. What do you mean you had a bad day? You didn't get messages, you know? It's like, are you shitting me? So where I come from, where I come from, that would not even be a factor. It is what it is. So I'm trying to train people in my circle or help them to understand. <clears throat> You're looking at the big picture wrong. The whole message of what life is all about is wrong. If you're complaining and blaming other people, it doesn't solve the problem. Stop blaming people and take care of shit. Get your shit together. You, first of all, before you blame others, you take care of yourself. You get better. And again, it goes back to nutrition, training, here and here being happy. Oh, what came again? The egg or the chicken? Which one is first? And that's the million dollar, you know, puzzle that people need to figure out for themselves. We, we, or me as a trainer, mentor, high-level practitioner in hand-to-hand combat, military, all the flashy things that I've, you know, so-called done, and I'm not looking for any prestige or ego, but I would say made me the person I am, and possibly people that are in my circles are saying, you know what, it's worth listening to that guy because he knows what he's talking. He did walk the walk. He did do interesting things. And um, I'm very humble about it. I'm very honored that I've done what I've done and I can inspire people. And uh, George is on board with me. And he he also served in the Romanian army. And don't forget, he also came from a regime where it was the Ceausescu period. You know, so, and he's a hard, he's a hard guy, George. Uh, it It would be pretty difficult to kick his ass. He's a very physical man. Um, so, so the idea of the message is simple take control you gotta be in control and just like in a military team I think love, compassion embracing, hugging being kind saying nice words when was the last time people said to their wife, girlfriend children, I love you hug them but things that cost zero and that bounce away boosts the immunity too. When you're happy, your immunity is high. If you're depressed, your immunity is low. You get sick, right? So we all know this, but are people applying it? Yes. Yeah. That's my message for everybody, my friend. Don't there is a message to be sent out there. It's been a brilliant message. I don't want to end, though, before asking you about um, this this university accreditation that you run. Oh, Protect Academy, Protect College. Yeah. Okay, so... And, and feel free um, to... feel free. To yes, yes. I, I will try to elaborate and explain what's the idea all about. So, um, in my company, I also have an academic section, Protect Academy. Uh, on the website, it appears Protect College. Um We have academic recognition from the Department of Education of the United States from the state of Maine. So it means we are legally permitted to give academic qualifications for achievements for or certificates or qualification, you can call it diploma, um, that are recognized in different fields. So what I have done, I have done something really interesting, and a lot of people really love this kind of work, where I know for a fact there's very little regulation in many, many countries worldwide about who can train or teach whatever subject. So, for example, if someone claims to be a real high-level practitioner in some style of martial art, he claims. doesn't mean it's true. He claims. He knows very little or knows nothing, but there's no regulation to prevent him from renting a space in the UK, bringing some dumbbells, club bells, some gymnasium punching bags, and start advertising and claim, I'm a specialist in Kung Fu, 
monkey, ninja, crap. And the average person doesn't know quality. He may be a very smooth talker and maybe even look good. He shaves his armpits and, you know, looks like, oh, I'm a tough guy. He's got lots of tattoos. And uh, he opens a school. So those who really possess a real good skill are in competition with someone who knows nothing. So if you look at systems that exist in the market, like there's stars for cars that, uh, you know, when they do crash tests from one star to five stars, they do a crash test. There is Michelin star for chefs. There's trip advisor for restaurants. But there's no academic recognition for people for their sweat, blood, and high-level achievements if they do possess one. So what Protect Academy does is that if someone does have a great skill, it could be yoga, pilates, golf, it can be martial arts, it can be any type of fitness, nutrition, strength, it can be military, it can be security, it can be defense, counterterrorism. So you have two sections, one for center of excellence for sports and martial arts, center of excellence for security, defense, and counterterrorism. So if someone is a graduate of the military or law enforcement and he wants to have some qualification in security, he works close protection. Or someone who specializes in canine. Do you know that the world of canine, handling dogs or training dogs, there is no academic qualification for that? Mm. If you're a power lifter, there is no academic qualification to say you are an excellent trainer in power lifting. So the guy is a power lifter. He knows how to do the routines and the drills, but he's not... He doesn't have a paper to prove it and put it on the wall. Now, all of us honestly love to have a, a, a diploma or a qualification to say, to claim legally, I am recognized by whoever, like something like TripAdvisor or Michelin stars for chefs. It's called Michelin because that's what they called it. So there's different standards in the market. And some hotels have five stars. Some hotels have one star. There's a standard. But for martial arts and sports, there is no real measurement to say who is and who isn't. I bump into so many people that are way below average that claim to be masters, and they're not. But they claim they're masters. So I don't want to shame anybody, but I'm saying what we do is people need to send one video for free, for free, zero. And if they can do the certain assignments about movement, biomechanics, and muscle groups, and explain the movement they were told. So let's say if someone wants to demonstrate yoga or pilates, I will have a, a someone who is a specialist in yoga or pilates to look at the sets of skills they claim they have and say, thumbs up, thumbs down, this guy, wow, well, we can accept them. So we only accept people that are, would, we, we would believe that would pass all the exams. So we don't take people's money then they start and they say, no, no, you're not good enough. I took someone's money. We don't do that. It's exactly the opposite. We only take people that we know very high chances they will start and finish. Now, if they quit in the middle, it's their problem, not mine. I provided a service. But we only take people that can really demonstrate unique skills. So if someone says, I'm a specialist on firearms and he knows how to hold the gun, demonstrate to me all the safety things about a firearm and so and so and so so if someone says to me i'm a specialist in counterterrorism and defense okay show me how you make a plan for a football event where boris johnson is going to be coming to the opening event you're in charge of security explain to me now if he doesn't know how to break it down and set up security different circles and the perimeters and where to position people he probably is not a specialist on doing security so standing at a door in a nightclub, okay, that's a skill. Body language, looking at people, taking out drunk people, not getting involved in any physical confrontation that will take you to prison because there's a lot of laws about how much force is right force and so on. But I'll say Protect Academy is one amazing product. That every guy that respects himself and he thinks he's or, or female that are really good at whatever they do from the field of anything to do with sports or martial arts, slash security, defense, counterterrorism, military, law enforcement, handling dogs. For example, rock climbing, rock climbing, there's rock climbing instructors, but it's not regulated by nobody. 
there's an association, there's an affiliation, but it's not an academic diploma. Yeah. So, and this can be done by sending you videos. So it can online, be- everything is online. You don't need to travel anywhere. Save the money. Sorry, friends at home, we've we've got some recording issue, and and Itai has lost his audio. So we're gonna we we we, we were gonna finish there anyway. So just to summarize, this is a wonderful opportunity. If you have a skill that you want to have um, academically recognized, if you want to get a diploma recognized by the University of Maine. Um, Not the University of Maine. No, no. No? Not the University of Maine. No? Okay. Explain. Sorry. Protect Academy is licensed under the Department of Education of the state of Maine. Ah, yes. Sorry. That's that's what I meant. <laughs> what I mean is, is officially accredited. Correct. Okay. Right. We're going to, we're going to end there. It's high. It's been great chatting. Thank you so much so um, for having me. We, we, we're going to chat again because I'm sure we can have uh, many, many chats on many, many subjects. For our friends at home, Massive love to you all. Please look after yourselves. If you can like and subscribe, that's going to help us. And we'll see you next time. Thank you. Thank you.